I just sense something special about this place tonight. I believe the Lord of glory wants to come down in our midst tonight and touch us. You see, I can't come to a pulpit today and not be touched and not be moved in my soul by the fact of the hour and the time that we're living in. I believe that we are living in one of the most treacherous times that the church has ever known. I sincerely believe tonight that the church is in hand-to-hand -hand combat with the devil. But I'm also convinced of the fact that where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. That gives me confidence to believe that God is greater than any force that comes against the church of Jesus Christ. And the victory is ours. Hallelujah. But I believe in these last days, in these closing moments, that God wants to declare himself God as at no other time in church history. I want to believe him tonight for a miracle to take place in this house. I want to believe him tonight for somebody's life to be changed. I want to believe him tonight for somebody to say, when they leave this house tonight, I feel like, feel like, feel like traveling on. Amen? Because God is in this place to do great works. I want to ask you if you would please to stand with me tonight. I want to read a passage of Scripture to you that is found in the book of Ephesians. The book of Ephesians is that unique book. It is written by the Apostle Paul from his jail cell, most likely in Rome. He's writing back to the church at Ephesus. And he speaks to them, and he has a little outline for the book, chapter 1, chapter 2, and chapter 3. He talks about the wealth of a Christian. And chapter 4, chapter 5, chapter 6, he talks about the walk of a Christian. And in chapter 6, beginning at verse 10, he talks about the warfare of a Christian. So the wealth, the walk, and the warfare of a Christian. But there's a prayer that I want to direct, direct your attention to tonight. And it's found in chapter 1. I want to begin reading at verse 16. He says, I cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayer, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may grant unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places far above all principalities and power and might and dominion and every name that is named not only in this world but also in that which is to come. And it put all things all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things of the church which is his body the fullness of him that filleth all and all would you join with me tonight as we pray together that God would move among us tonight through the ministry of his word shall we pray father God we ask you tonight in the name of Jesus that you would sweep across this congregation tonight that you would speak to our hearts O Lord and that you would speak to us in a special way because we are living in tragic times. We're living in testing times. We're living in tempting times. But Lord, they're tremendous because they're opportunity to serve you as never before. And we pray that you will touch us tonight in your word that we will leave here strong in the might and the power of the Holy Ghost. For we ask this, O Lord, in the wonderful, precious name of Jesus Christ. For it's in his name we pray. And amen, and amen. And you may be seated. This is a passage of scripture that I find has a lot of meaning to me, especially right now. The Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, that the man of God might be thoroughly furnished in all things. 
That's why the Word of God is given to us. We are challenged today by the Word of God. You and I, we have special needs in our life. There are needs that are just as common to you as there are to me because we're on this journey together. Someone has said that there are three particular needs that everybody must experience in their life. First of all, there is a feeling of security. People want to feel as though they are secure in where they are. There is a second particular need in people's lives, and that is a need for significance. When security and significance has been established, then there is a need for sufficiency that you would have the wherewithal to make it go once you have achieved. Someone has said that it is, this is predominant in, in young men's life that they seek after, after significance. That's when you go buy that new Corvette or that's when you are trying to do something and outdo somebody else. And, and somebody has said that this is when it is, that security is more, significant, more evident in the lives of young men. But significance seems to be the way that women look at it. Or security, I'm sorry. Women wanting to be secure. And then they tell us that about halfway through life there's a role change. That's when women want to say, we've come a long way, baby. And men want to put a fence around themselves and change the role. I guess we are faced with changes in our life. And that's a very common thing for all of us because life is full of changes. But I'm here to tell you tonight that God's Word addresses these things and is up to date with us in our life today. God has an answer for our needs. God can supply all your needs according to His riches in glory. Now as I begin to look at this passage of Scripture, I notice that the writer Paul says that he asked God that God would give us a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. You see, there are some things that are so grandiose. There are some things that are so high and so promising in God's Word. Unless He touches us, it's hard for us to grab hold of it and really realize that this is for me and this is for my life. I notice what he goes on to say. He says in the next verse, he says, not all that, he said that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know something. That's the challenge of our day, is to know something. You know what Job said in chapter 19? Job said, I know my Redeemer liveth. There is something about knowing something, knowing it down deep in your soul. That is the essence of faith. When you know something, Paul said that you may know what is the hope of his calling that you may know what is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power. I see as I look at the word of God, he tells us first of all that there is a hope of our calling. When you come to the house of God, when you come in this sanctuary tonight, when you come to do something for the Lord, you have to understand it is not an accident that you're here because no man can come to the Father except the Spirit draw him. God has chosen you today to be his child. God has selected and God has ordained you to be his instrument to be used in these last days that we live in. Now the significance of this is simply this. When I look around me, I realize that this is the closing day of this, this, this generation. This is the closing day of this dispensation. When the signs and wonders are taking place around us, we see an increase of knowledge according to Daniel chapter 11. We see the things that are taking place in the world today that were prophesied by Scripture. And the things I just mentioned to you a few moments ago. We see all these things are happening and they're all coming to pass. Right now, they're coming to pass. There has never been a generation alive in the history of man when all of the promises of God's Word are seemingly like crossing at one particular time. We are living in momentous days today, my friend. Now when I look around me, 
I don't see, I don't see when I look about me in an Elijah. I don't see a John the Baptist. I don't see an Apostle Paul. I don't see someone like that. I look about me and I see men who I've known in ministry all of my life. I see you here. Some of you I've known for years. And when I start thinking about what God has done, God has waited to the last day. God has waited to the moment when His Son Jesus Christ is even at the door. Oh, Jesus, God has waited to this day to allow you and I to live in this moment and we are here to usher in the coming of Jesus Christ. My friend, you have been selected to live in a momentous time. Now God has a purpose for you and God has a reason for you. But I, I must also warn you that the devil has set his sights on you. The devil has al already made plans for you. The devil has already tried to overload you. The devil has already tried to discourage you. The devil has already tried to throw roadblocks in your way to stop you. But it's, it's, that's a lie of the devil because he is the accuser and he comes to throw these things in our way and tries to stop us. That's his role. But I've come to tell you tonight that you are special in the sight of Almighty God. And if the shackles could be taken off of our eyes and we could see how really special we are in God's sight, we would suddenly pull our royal robes about us. We'd square our shoulder and we would say the end is just in sight. And devil, you're going to see the worst fight out of me you've ever seen in the history of mankind. Kind, I'm going to leave this world fighting you to the last mile of the way, doing everything I can to tear your kingdom down. Amen? Well, I tell you, it is amazing to me when I think about this, when I think about the security that we have in Jesus Christ. Oh, yes, we are secure in Him because He has chosen us to be here today. He said, I pray that you may know what is the hope of your calling. Have you ever thought about this matter of calling? You see, God has called you for a particular work. He says in Acts chapter 2, verse 39, For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all them that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Aren't you proud that you have been called to live in this Holy Ghost dispensation? Aren't you proud that you've been called to live in this day? Doug, when I studied the history of revival, I realized at the turn of the century there was only a few scattered people that ex experienced the baptism of the Holy Ghost. But I'm living in a day today when there are 500 million people that testify to being baptized with the Holy Ghost and speak in other tongues. And I just realized, God, you have let me see this. You've called me to live in a day of the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. It ought to make you want to shout your shoes off to know you're living in a day when there is no limit to the power of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. He tells us, Paul said in Galatians 1.15, he says, when, I was, when, I, when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by His grace to reveal His Son in me. Sometimes the devil will come and tell you you are nothing from nowheresville and you've got no hope in front of you. But Paul said, God has called me from my mother's womb. Child of God, it's about time you realize there is a calling on your life not just for preachers and not just for a few people that maybe stand in front of a congregation but God has a specific calling he has called you from day one and he has a job to do for you you are selected you are ordained and may I say to you that no one else can do for God what he has called you to do he has selected you he has called you he has prepared you do you understand that the great God of heaven knows your name. He knows what streets you live on. He knows where you come from. He knows what you've been through. And he says, I've called you for a ministry in these last days. Timothy, 2 Timothy 1 and 9 says, Who has saved us? 
and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to but according to His own purpose and grace, has, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before the worlds were made. I must remind you again: you fit in the pattern. You're part of the pattern. You are not just something isolated out here, bobbing and weaving and trying to find your place. No. God has selected you. God has ordained you. God has chosen you. And God has called you. That's why it says in 1 Peter 2 and 3, but ye are a chosen generation. You hear what I said? A chosen generation. A royal priesthood. A holy nation. A peculiar people. Why? That you should show forth the praises of Him who has called you out of darkness into His his marvelous light. God has chosen you to be a lighthouse. God has chosen you to be salt. God has chosen you to be a light on a, in a, on a hillside. God has called you to be a city that cannot be hid. God has selected you. Amen. You say, why? So that you won't walk the same drumbeat of this world. So you won't hang your head down in despair. So you won't walk through this place thinking you're by yourself. But he's called a generation. He's called a chosen people who know they have somebody with them. Hallelujah. He's called a people that know what's about to happen. He's called a people that are not in despair today. He's called a people that are in tune with the heavenly world. And the world can sit on your face because they know where you've been. You've been to Calvary and they know where you're going. You're going to that city, that city that God has made for you. Hallelujah. That's why he calls the word ecclesia. It simply means that those called out one. That's the word for church. It is called out, called out. That's why Paul said in Philippians 3.14, he said, I press toward the mark, toward the prize of a high calling in Christ Jesus our Lord. You see that there is something about being called. I'm telling you today, Brother Massey, my mama didn't call me. My daddy didn't call me. My preacher didn't call me. My church didn't call me. But heaven called me. God called me. I'm a God called man. I'm preaching to a God called congregation tonight. God's got a, a purpose for you and God's got a reason for you and you're not just a citizen of no mean country. You're a child of the king. You're joint heir with Jesus Christ. You've been picked up. You've been picked up out of nothing and you've been put down in the middle of everything. You're called. Sometimes the devil tell you you're nothing. Sometimes the devil will jump on your shoulder. You better say you're messing with some valuable property, devil. I'm a child of the king. I'm a child of the king. I'm a child of the king. And God's watching your every move. And just as soon as you put more on me than I'm able to bear, the Bible says according to 1 Corinthians 10, 13, that God will make a way for my escape because I'm a chosen, redeemed child of God, a chosen generation that you may know what is the hope of your calling. Amen. He said in, in Romans 8, 28, And we know that all things work together for the good of them who love God, to them who are called according to His purpose, for whom He did foreknow them, that He did also predestinate to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the fourth firstborn of many brethren. Moreover, whom He did foreknow them, did, him He did predestinate them, He also called. And whom He also called them, He also justified. And whom He also justified them, He also glorified. And what shall we then say to these things? If God be for you, who can be against you? My, 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 my. Somebody said, if God be for you, who cares who's against you? And I think that's pretty good interpretation if you ask me. Since I'm called, everything works together for my good. And since I'm called, I'm telling you that great God of heaven is on my side. When you jump on me, you better get ready for Jehovah. When you mess with me, you better get ready for my elder brother. When you mess with me, you're going to do war with angels because I'm a chosen I'm a chosen generation. I've been called for this last day ministry. Amen. But he says there is a hope to this calling. A hope to this calling. Oh, yes, there's a hope to this calling. And you know, hope is that feeling, you know, that's that certainty that needs the it needs the 
no visible foundation to rest upon. Hope, you know something is there. I notice in Second, First Corinthians 15, 19 and 20, it says, If in this life only we have hope in Christ Jesus, we are of all men most miserable. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of them that sleep. May I just slow down just for a minute to tell you what I got when Jesus called me. He gave me a hope of a resurrection and immortality. If you ever read in a newspaper sometime an obituary that says Dennis McGuire is dead, you laugh up your sleeve because I won't be dead. I have already done my dying. I died an old-fashioned altar, and when it comes time to leave this world, I'll say, O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? I'm lo somewhere, somewhere, 10,000 years from right now, these eyeballs are going to be looking around because I've got a hope today because he called me out of nothing and put me into everything. I've got a hope of a resurrection one of these days and immortality. I shall never die because he picked me up and gave me peace. He picked me up and wrote my name on the Lamb's Book of Life. Not only do I have a hope of a resurrection and immortality in Jesus Christ, I have a hope that I will rule and reign with him. In Revelation 3.21, it says to him that overcometh, will I, sit, will, will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I overcame and am sit down at, with my Father in his throne. Now, you better be careful with me again, I tell you right now, because you may be looking at the future governor of Alabama. Seven years and one day from right now can very well happen. Because when this old world, when Jesus steps out on the clouds of glory and raptures the church home, we're going home to be with him for seven years. We're going to go be with him for the marriage supper of the Lamb. And when we come back, we're going to put the devil in a bottomless pit. And somebody said he wanted to shout on the lid when they sealed him in there. I don't know. But when we come back, we are going to rule and reign in this old world. The mayor of Birmingham can very well be sitting here seven years and one day from right now. I tell you, I got hope tonight. I'm looking at princes, and I'm looking at princesses. I'm looking at kings. When I stand up here, I'm not just looking at somebody that came from this church or that church, but I'm looking at the redeemed, those who've been washed the robes white in the blood of the Lamb, those that are waiting on the signal from glory when they shall be changed in a moment of twinkling of an eye. Holy be to God, and we shall rule, and we shall reign with him. You say, why am I having all the problems I'm having? You're having those problems because you're being tested for leadership. God's getting you ready to serve. If you suffer with him, you shall reign with him. If you suffer with him, you shall reign with him. It's not time to run and hide. No, you're getting some training. You're coming back, brother. You're coming back, sister. You're going to sit on the throne, and it's going to be holiness unto the Lord. You're coming back, and we're going to praise and magnify the Lord. Lord, I got a hope of glory in my soul tonight. I hope if you come dragging in here feeling sorry for yourself, felt like the devil kicked you around and slapped you around, beat you up one side the other. I hope before this service is over, you'll look around for him and say, I'd like to get my hands on you, you lying, accusing rascal. You, you don't know who you're messing with. I'm the redeemed of the Lord. God's called me. God sent me where I am. He, you didn't give it to me, and you can't take it away from me. Hallelujah. Well, 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 well. Hallelujah. You see, not only that, but I find in 1 Peter 1, 3, and 4 about a blessed inheritance that I've got. The Bible said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy 
hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and fadeth not away reserved for me in heaven hallelujah you hear what the scripture saying the scripture saying that I've got an inheritance somewhere beyond the blue you don't need to be thinking about me as some poor preacher just come by tonight brother I am rich and I'm looking at some rich people. Amen. Amen. You see, you may not have inherited anything from your grandpa, and you might not have got any land out of your grandma, and you may have to pay your own daddy's burial expenses, but you are still a rich person if you know my heavenly Father. Amen. Because the Bible says there is a blessed hope. There is a hope within, within me that one of these days I shall receive that lively hope, that resurrection from the dead, and I shall be called away to an inheritance eternal that's reserved for me in glory the last time I read about it you see when I read about that city the walls are 1500 miles high and 1500 miles long and 1500 miles square the cheapest thing oh Jesus help us tonight the cheapest thing in that city is gold and it's pure as glass and you can see through it the walls are made out of jasper there are 12 foundations that the walls set up on there are 12 gates the city and they're all made out of pearl and they got an angel angel standing there glory be to God and they got one over there by the name of Jehovah God that wipes away all tears from your eyes and there will be no, no night there because Jesus is the light of the city there will be no sickness because the former things have passed away and there's a tree for the healing of all nations and the best part about it is it belongs to us tonight because our elder brother has gone to he's going to prepare a place for us he said if I go prepare a place for you I shall come again and receive you unto myself that where I am there you may be also praise God hallelujah I know this there's going to be a perfect transformation. 1 John 3, 2 and 3 says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God. It doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifies himself even as we are pure. Oh, yes. Your arthritis is temporary. Your blindness is temporary. Your deafness is temporary. Your sight is temporary. One of these days, at the moment, the twinkling of an eye, something glorious is going to happen. You're going to be changed in a moment and a twinkling of an eye. Do you believe it? Do you really believe it? Do you really believe it? We sit sometimes like a young calf looking at a new gate, just staring out the door. I told you God didn't help your understanding. You couldn't catch it tonight. And if God don't touch me, it's too deep for me to preach. But somehow I believe somebody's hanging into it. Somebody that the devil fought you up one side and down the other. Somebody that the devil told you you were of no worth. Somebody that the devil told you that, he, that you were going to fall by the wayside. Somebody that thought you were going to be snatched out. You understand God has made plans for your life. And the devil can't snatch you out because God has kept. If the devil could have killed some of you, you'd have been dead a long time ago. But you don't belong to the devil, honey. You're a called person. You're secure in Jesus Christ tonight. Upon Jesus Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. I feel Holy Ghost anointing in this place tonight. I feel the Holy Spirit moving in this place tonight. Shake off your bondage. Shake off your, your times of lethargy. It's time to realize who you are. You're a child of the King. And you're secure in Jesus Christ. Because no devil, no demon, no power above the earth, in the earth, or under the earth can take you out of the hands of God.
I was talking to a precious young convert this past week. DeRosa and I, we were with them at a restaurant, and she was crying. And she was saying, I'm so afraid. I'm so afraid. I'm so afraid. I said, that's wrong, honey. That's wrong. But you know the devil is the accuser. If anybody ought to be afraid, it's the devil afraid. You're not going to miss it. If you desire to walk in his ways, my friend, he will surround you with his love because he selected you, he called you, he picked you up. That's why he says in Isaiah 43, he says, But thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called you by your name, and you are mine. And when thou walkest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. And when thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned neither shall the flames kindle upon thee for I am the Lord thy God the Holy One of Israel my God somebody lift your hands and praise the Lord in this house tonight If this city just knew who was in this building tonight, if they just knew this is the redeemed of the Lord, if they just knew that the people in this building have all the gifts that God's promised, if the people, if the city just knew that the people in this house possess the promises of this book because God said, I called them, I redeemed them, I separated them, I called them to my work, and you're precious in his sight, my friend. But then Paul makes a second statement. He says that we may know what is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in us. Now there's some commentaries who have tried their best to make it seem as though that, that he is our inheritance. But that's not the way it is. This scripture is saying that we are the inheritance of God. Now that's the part I can't understand. That's the thing I can't really grasp tonight. Why God would love us, but we are his. We are his inheritance. He said we are his jewels. He said of Israel that Israel in Isaiah chapter 19, 25, he said Israel was his inheritance. Again in Joel 3 and 2, he talks about Israel being his inheritance. And again, you see, we understand that God gets glory out of us. When I think about the stars and they shine and you can see the light but they can't see. When I think about the creation and all the things it goes through, it's just there. But when I think about a soul of a man, when I think about man's soul, you see we don't put the proper emphasis on the soul. The soul is the most precious thing in all the universe because that soul is the heritage and it is the inheritance of great Jehovah God. God. Your soul is important. That's why it says he that win a souls is wise. We put our emphasis on carpet. We put our emphasis on buildings. We put our emphasis on, in, on, on programs. But God puts his emphasis on souls because there is nothing more important than the soul because the soul is the inheritance of God Almighty. When I think about what God has done for the soul, you see God doesn't want oil. He takes oil and puts it under the ground. God doesn't want diamonds. He, he takes diamonds and covers it over with mountains of dirt. He doesn't want that. But there is something that God wants. It is the praise of his people. Don't you know that God is pleased? When you think about what goes on in this world, when you think about the thousands of people tonight in the surrounding community who are cursing the name of God right now, there are people in this community right now who are involved in all sorts of sin and debauchery, and they're using God's name. They're using it for a byword. All around this community, there are people right now that are not even thinking about God, and the God is the least thought of their mind. They hate God. They hate the church. They hate everything that, that is related to God. But then you come into this sanctuary tonight and here you are, several thousand people sitting here today and you've come for one reason. You have come to glorify and praise God. Do you not think that the angels of glory are bending over the banister tonight and their eyes are focused on this place? Because the souls, the never dying souls, the redeemed souls, how the heart and the soul of the church of God in Alabama has assembled together in this place together tonight. I tell you that anything can happen because God says when just two or three souls gather together, there am I in the midst of them. But when a 
congregation like this and I begin to feel that supernatural move my friend when a congregation like this gets together and they begin to realize that they are the inheritance of God and God wants them to be healed and God wants them to be set free and God wants them to be baptized with the Holy Ghost and God wants them to receive a new touch and God wants to give them a double portion when they realize that they're so precious in God's sight all they'll have to do is to yield their soul to God and one wave of glory after another will come in this place because God is seeking a people I tell you God is seeking a people God is seeking a people God is seeking a people who will praise him who will glorify him who will magnify him who will lift up his name in praise and adoration You know the most frightening thing about preaching this camp meeting? The most frightening thing is not getting up here. But the most frightening thing is souls. Souls. Souls that are sitting here. Discouraged souls. Souls that are full of heartache and souls that are bruised and wounded, souls that are in the valley of decision. And the real challenge and the real scary thing to stand here tonight is to say, if we would lose one precious soul out of this place today, it would be an inestimable loss. There's no way to describe how bad the loss would be. But every soul, if we would let God renew us, restore us, and refire us, and, and fill us again, I tell you, hallelujah, you would set together in heavenly places. And that's what camp meeting's all about, for God to come down and minister to his church. Oh, that you may know that we are God's inheritance. Amen. Pretty special in this sight. I was driving the other day by a piece of land in Cleveland, Tennessee, and I saw a sign, and it said, No trespassing. And right behind it said, Absolutely no trespassing. And down the, about a few feet later, it said, No trespassing. And it said again, Protected by Smith and Wesson, No trespassing. It looked to me just like any ordinary, sorry piece of ground. I just looked at it as nothing unusual. It just wasn't fit to grow a garden or anything else, but somebody said, stay off of it. Somebody said, this is mine. Don't mess with it. Don't touch it. And I got to thinking, you know, there's some things that belong to me. And I don't know that I want them to, to scattered all over the face of the earth. And, but I don't have anything that really precious that I got a smith and with and sitting there trying to protect a few old pine trees. I don't have that. But I got to think about God, you know. God does have a few things that are precious. And you know, just leave it to Job to let the cat out of the bag. Job said, God said to Job, you know, and said the devil, says, why don't you touch him? And the devil said about Job, you've got a hedge around him. You've got a hedge around him. And then I got to reading and the writer said, there's a wall of fire all around me. And then I get to thinking, wait a minute, I'm God's inheritance. Maybe if I could open my eyes and see where the devil let the cat out of the bag when he was talking about Job, I'd understand. Listen, since I am a precious soul in God's sight, there is a wall around me today. There is a hedge around me. There's a wall of fire around me. Some of these folks feel like they can have the devil and be demon-possessed and have the Holy Ghost at the same time. You're not inside the fire I'm talking about tonight. You're not behind the wall I'm talking about. You're not where I am. I'm God's. I'm his alone. And when I stand there, I sort of look at that hedge around me and I see that fire around me. And it seems like I can just see that there's a, that there's a sign written in blood that says no trust passing devil leave him alone this is my inheritance he's my child you can't touch him he's been redeemed by my grace I want to tell you I tell you I have security in Jesus I am significant in him because I belong totally to the Lamb of God who purchased my soul on Calvary 2,000 years ago but he goes a step further he said that you might know what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe 
according to the working of his mighty power. He is sufficient for the task. He is sufficient for the task. You might come up to me and say, Brother McGuire, write me a check for a million dollars. I could write you one, but you couldn't cash it. I don't have what it takes to back it up. Well, I've been making you some promises here tonight. I've been talking about somebody that called you. I've been talking about a resurrection. I've been talking about immortality. I've been talking about ruling and reigning with Jesus. But can you back it up, brother? Can you back it up? And that's what Paul says in this next verse. He says that you might know what is the exceeding greatness of his power. Now, there are basically five words that can be interpreted for power in the New Testament. And I'm no Greek scholar, but I found that there are four of these words that are mentioned in one little scripture. There's more power in this, this portion of scripture than was in Mount St. Helens when it blew a square mile in the air. There's more power in this than any dynamo that's ever been made. There is more power in this scripture than all the atomic and hydrogen bombs in the whole wide world. There is power in what I'm getting ready to tell you about. I'm here to tell you, my friend, God has got the power to back up what he says. I tell you, he's got the power to cleanse the spotted leper. He's got the power to make the wounded whole. He's got the power to put new life inside of you. He's got the power to bring strength to your body. He's got the power to revive you. He's got the power. Somebody better pray for me. I'm excited. i got to slow down and preach a little bit. I'm talking about power, 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 power. I'm not talking about something that just pulled out of a can somewhere. I'm not talking about some little poem or essay. I'm talking about power that makes demons tremble. I'm talking about power that makes the gates of hell shake. I'm talking about power. I'm talking about power that opens the prison bars at midnight. I'm talking about power that when they think the church is about to go under, then a Holy Ghost reaches. Bible breaks out. That's the kind of power I'm talking about tonight. I get to feel like this. I got a running streak on me, but this is too big of a building to run. Get back up here. Dear Lord, it's inside of me. I feel God in my soul. Let's look at it. He said that you may know what is exceeding greatness of his power. That word there is dunamis. That means stored up power. God's got enough stored up power. He don't even have to reach in his reserve to slap the devil around in your, your life. He has got dynamic dunamis stored up power that's a sufficient that if the devil ever comes up with anything else he won't even have to go into his reserve it is no way for you there is no way for you to describe the mighty power of God you see he stepped out on nothing and he said let there be and all of creation was waiting to see what he would say and he just said light and at 386,000 miles light started moving big way back when I don't know and it's still going because the creator God said move I'm telling you he's got enough stored up power that there's no power that can stop you from doing his work where he sent you to go because he has ordained you and he's equipped you and he's given you the power that's stored up to do the work with amen he said according to the working now the word working there is energia it's literally can be translated the energy and I'm telling you I have felt the energy of the power of God in this place today he only uses this one time in the scripture and it's used right here this is the energy of God he's talking about does anybody in this house tonight feel the energy of God the energy of God. Has it got down in your bosom tonight? Has it run up and down the avenues of your soul tonight? Has it got down deep in your soul tonight? Do you feel something moving in your heart? Do you feel something... Do you feel something about to explode inside of you? Is there a praise that's coming into your heart right now that wants to scream out and say, Holy, holy art thou, Lord God Almighty. Is there a faith that's beginning to rise in your soul? Then, my friend, that's the energy of God that you can sense in this house tonight. I 
sense his power. I sense his energy. I sense his glory. I sense his power in this place right now. Revival time is now because the energy of God is moving among us. I'm in your midst, saith the Lord of hosts. Don't, don't pass this opportunity up to touch me. For I am here in power and I am here in glory. I am here as you praise me. I will dispatch my angels to fight your battles for you. For I've got the power, saith the Lord of hosts. Don't miss this opportunity to know me, saith the Lord of glory. For my power is in this place. I will do it, saith the Lord. 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 Because I have promised you, and what I promised you, I will surely do, saith the Lord of glory. Receive my promise, saith the Lord of glory. Would you lift your hands and praise him across this place? Mm. Would you stand to your feet, please? There is the kratos, that is the power to resist. There is the ischus, that is the actual strength that is in this house. The power of God. But you see, was it ever proven? Yes, it was proven. How was it proven? It was proven by the fact that Jesus Christ got up from the dead. Jesus Christ arose from the dead. Not only that, he ascended to the heavenly Father far above all principalities and power and might and dominion and every name that is mentioned. He's become the head over everything. All things. You see, I went through a terrible battle one time in my life. It's as real as if it were yesterday. The devil told me, I'm going to kill you. You know what? I believed him. I got afraid. My heart started beating irregularly, and I got very sick. Part of that sickness, I tried to keep it to myself, and finally I had to just share it with my wife. And I said to Rosa, fill my heart. And she said to me, if you don't let me get some sleep, we're going to both die. Now, that's the way women are when you get sick, you know. You know, when you get sick, men think they're going to die. You know, you get a headache, men think it's a brain tumor. Woman gets sick, you say, you get better, or you'll be all right. That's the way it is. I got worse. Finally, one day, she told me, you're sick. You don't need to go drive a hundred miles to church today and she said something that scared me to death she said you're going to die because I was sick I thought I was going to die but didn't have any insurance I thought if I drive the car I'll at least get $65,000 out of all state insurance you know if I die driving so I just drive down the road but I'll never forget that day I thought I'll surely die this day and I started down the road, and I'd feel my heart. And my heart would stop beating. And the devil would say, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill you. Didn't wouldn't say it at all, but he just, I'm going to kill you. And I went to preach in a little church in Austin, Indiana. I'll never forget that day. And all the way down there, I thought this is going to be my last day. I'm going to die. I'm going to die. And I pulled off of the interstate to go to that church that morning figuring this is going to be my last sermon. 
When I pulled off the interstate, I was praying. And the Holy Spirit just seemed to say, open your Bible. And I flipped my Bible open. And it turned to 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. And it says, For God hath not given you a spirit of fear, but of love and power and of a sound mind. Now, you know, that's where I usually shout right there. But the Holy Ghost said, read the next scripture. Be not therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me as prisoner. But be thou a partaker of the afflictions of the gospel. Now, that registered home to me because I know what partaker is all about. That means you reach in and get some more of it. And you pull it yourself. Now the Word of God is telling me, Dennis, I want you to be a partaker of the afflictions. Honestly, friends, I was at a place that I was about to say, Devil, if you leave me alone, I'll leave you alone. You ever been there? Almost to that place. I figured I was going to die. But then there's a little phrase that says, According to the power. And it dawned on me. I've been fighting my own battles. I've been trying to reason my own things out. I've been trying to use my own abilities. And I'm a nervous wreck. My body is about to collapse on me. I'm about to die. But the Bible says, according to the power of God. I said, devil, now if you can today, I want you to kill me. Today is going to be a shootout at the OK Corral. When I get to that church, I'm going to preach like my shirt tail's on fire and it's 60 miles a barrel of water. And if you can, devil, I want you to let my eyeballs pop out of my socket. I want blood to gush out of my nose and out my ears. If you can, devil, I want you to kill me while I'm in that pulpit today. I went to that little church and they had a penny march and they had everything in the world to go on and sung every kind of drifted down the stream of time song we could sing. And I was sitting there thinking, oh God, this is my last one. I want to go out in a blaze of glory. Let my children get this tape. It's going to be their daddy's finest hour. The devil's going to have to do it today. And finally, they talked about what a great person I was. And I thought, if you only knew, I'm as lost as a goose. I don't know which way I'm turning. But when they turned this hillbilly loose that morning, I ran to that pulpit like a bull out of a chute. I figure I'm going out in a blaze of glory. And I started preaching. I preached 10 minutes, and I started feeling strong. And I preached 15 minutes, and I was feeling stronger. And it dawned on me, you've been lying to me, devil. You put a spirit over Mary. You, you put a spirit of death on me, devil. You, you put a spirit of death on me. You were going to stop me. That's what you were going to do, devil. And about 30 minutes in that sermon, I hit a running streak. And the last time I looked behind me, there was five men chasing me. We ran all over that church like a racehorse. I'm here to tell you, when I got back to the full pulpit, I decided it's time to walk a few pews. I ran down the center section of pews, right at the back of the pews. For one hour and 45 minutes, they had never seen anything come to the little church like they did in Austin, Indiana that morning. A wild state overseer that realized that he's the accuser. He's a liar. He didn't give it to me. And he can't take it away.
God, the lines drawn in this place today. The lines drawn in here. I'm here to tell you that God touched me while I was preaching that sermon, and I've never had that problem to this day. It was nothing but a lie of the devil. It was nothing but an oppression of the devil. Tonight, I have been feeling power in this house, and I'm not going to beg anybody to come. But if there's some people in this place that you want to have a confrontation with the enemy of your soul, with the enemy of your church, and you want to draw the line, and you want to say, devil, meet me where the fountain flows. Devil, meet me at the altar. Meet me where the fire burns. Devil, meet me there because I've got something to settle with you. I want to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. I want, I want to be filled with the Spirit. I want to be safe. So come on. Come on, sister. There it is. Come on. Run. If you need something from God, come. If you need to touch some God, move from where you are. Come on. If you need a double portion, quickly. Quickly. The Holy Ghost is there. Don't resist it. Don't resist it. Come. Come in the name of Jesus. There's power. There's power. There's power. Don't hold back. Holy brother, holy brother, holy brother, look who's here, look who's here, look who's here. It's not second and third generation Pentecostals because you've got your mind made up. You've already got your mind made up, but you're fighting some big devils. It's about time you let your pride down. It's about time you hit an altar. It's about time you had a revival. It's about time you move. If you want it, if you want it, you can have it. If you want deliverance tonight, you can have it. If you want healing tonight, you can have it. Hold it, brother. Hold it. Hold it. You foul devil of hell, I dare you to try to move in this place tonight. I come against you in the name of the Lord God, Jehovah. I've come tonight to believe there's power in this place to break a yoke. To break a yoke. To break a yoke. Anybody want to meet a delivering God, an old-fashioned order for your family? Do you want to meet him here for your son? Do you want to meet him for your daughter? Do you want to meet him for your finance? Do you want to meet God here tonight to be filled with the Holy Ghost? Hey! I never felt the Holy Ghost in a house I feel him here tonight. If you'll move as the Spirit moves, God's promised me that there'll be a yoke broken in your life. And I'm not going to beg you any longer. You were born in the fire and you can't stand the smoke. But if you want it, I want to count to five. I'm going to change the order of this altar. If you're not here, then you're going to miss a glorious opportunity. One, two, three, four. Get on your way, five. I want every Holy Ghost filled saint in this house. I want you to meet me down here and find somebody to lay hands on. Find somebody to pray. Find somebody to touch the Lord. Find somebody that you can believe the Lord for. There's power. There's power. There's power in the house. Thank you, brother. Lay hands on them. 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 Thank you, sister. My God, that meeting spoke out here tonight. Revival broke out here tonight. The devil been lying to somebody. The devil's been lying to you. According to the power of God. 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 According to the power of God.